It is a great honor to give this lecture this morning. I am very grateful to the Japan Prize Committee for giving me this prize, and I want to talk a little bit about how we made the transition many years ago, which we're still making, from the information theory to the information age. Thank you. <laughs> Communication capabilities are perhaps the most important difference between humans and other animals. Animals have communication with each other, but it's not very refined. It's not as, has as many capabilities as we have. Communication is necessary for humans to work together, to share scientific, psychological, political, and social ideas, and to share the many joys of living. Our propensity to fight before carefully communicating is perhaps the greatest danger facing human survival. The Japan Prize in Electronics, Communication, and Information is for enabling communication technology, not for individual works of communication themselves. It is for the technology that has given rise to this information age. In a little less than 75 years, Communication technology has moved from primitive telephony and TV and uh, uh, other things like uh, uh, telegraph and facsimile to the marvels of the information age. The principles allowing this shift were largely laid out by Claude Shannon in 1948 in an article entitled A Mathematical Theory of Communication. This is now usually known as information theory, and I'll make a few comments later about what Shannon thought about calling it information theory, and perhaps what I think about calling it information theory. What this theory concerned was getting messages from one place to another. Messages have many different types, but the main difference in messages is some are discrete and some are analog. Instead of trying to define that, I will just give you some examples of discrete and analog, and you will see what I mean by the difference. Uh, text messages are discrete. Data is discrete. Computer programs are discrete. Things you read off the internet and copy and keep them are discrete. Analog is speech, video, music, recordings of art, whatever. Pre-Shannon, different types of messages required different types of communication systems. Telephone for speech, TV for video, etc. Shannon recognized that an essential purpose for a communication system, perhaps the essential purpose, is to enable the receiver to distinguish between the messages entering the transmitter. I will say much more about that as we go on but keep it in mind that that's, that's what communication is, the ability to distinguish the possible things that might be getting communicated. The form of the messages, message can be changed. That's usually necessary for the physical communication medium. If you're sending something over an optical fiber, you need to send it at a very high frequency, but you send it at a high frequency, then you bring it down again when it gets to the destination. For example, a telegraph sender encodes text into dots and dashes, and the receiver translates back to the original text. We will think about that in two different ways, and they're both important. One is that after you translate something to dots and dashes, like Morse code does, uh, you can think of a dot as being a zero and a dash as being a one. Perhaps a better way to think about it is that binary data does not have to be zero or one. Binary data can be any choice between two alternatives. More generally, in a communication system, the messages of each type can be encoded into strings of binary digits, just like they were in the example of telegraph before. Thus, you can use the same system for all types. Uh, you have a source, what is the source? The source is where the messages come from. What are the messages? 
The messages are the things that come from sources. I will do this all along today. I hope you will forgive me, but it is difficult to define some of these things. The only way you can find them in an engineering and a system, system way uh, is to give many examples until you understand thoroughly what they mean. So we have a source which creates the messages. Then these messages get turned into binary data. Then there's an encoder, which in fact adds redundancy. I'll talk a good deal about that later because that's the thing that I was concerned with many, many years ago. Finally, there's a modulator, which is the thing that takes this message, whatever it is in this form now, and puts it up to the kind of frequency which can be transmitted. And then there's a noisy channel. What's a noisy channel? A noisy channel is something that puts noise into what comes into it. Uh, at the other end of this ch channel, there's what went into the channel uh, plus this noise. And the noise might be in many different forms. If you, uh, if, if you think of being in a cocktail lounge, uh, being 20 meters from the person you're talking to, you all understand exactly what I mean by noise. Then we go from the what's received from the noisy channel, which now has all this noise on it, to the modulator, which does the opposite of the modulator, uh, and uh, then a decoder, which does the opposite of the encoder, and then we convert from these binary digits, which come out of the decoder, into the message which is supposed to be the same or almost the same as what came from the source. The practice of encoding message sources into binary data has become almost universal for communication systems. When you think of communication systems today, what do you ask? How many bits a second does it tr transmit? You don't ask how many signals of what different form. You think of all communication systems in terms of bits. Using a common representation such as binary data uh, is, is particularly useful in networks since when you use binary data for each link, as you go from one link to the next link to the next link, you can always decode back to the original binary data. That can be done for any digital medium, but it's most convenient for binary data. Why people invented uh, uh, languages using letters uh, for English, we have one set of letters. For Japanese, you have another set of letters. Uh, why we use those letters, I am not quite sure. Uh, they seem to fit our psychological makeup. Uh, but for the makeup of the computers, uh, which, which transmit all these signals, binary is the obvious choice. Uh, it's very important to recognize that you can use a common network for all message types, if you convert things to binary first, then all you have to do on each link of the network is to, is to send the binary data. And finally, when you get all to the end, there's this binary data, which you then convert back to what you hope is the message that came from the source. Using binary data as a common representation for communication systems is not necessary, but it was an obvious choice since we were building this with, with hardware. Uh, it's obvious um, compared to, to decimal digits uh, where there are 10 of them instead of two, or letters in a given language, which is terrible. Uh, I am very fortunate being here in Japan where many of you speak English and I can speak in English. If I were in some other country, which recognize it other languages less than you do, I would be in a real pickle. I couldn't talk to you. It would be terrible. So I'm very happy to be in Japan, where many of you speak English also, because I assure you, I cannot speak Japanese at all. I would not be here if I had to learn Japanese. It is so hard for me to learn a language, a foreign language. I tried for many years to learn French. I could not do it. 
I am too stupid to learn foreign languages. I can only do mathematics. And that is fortunate for me because I'm now winning the Japan Prize because of mathematical things I did and engineering things I did. I did not have to learn other languages. I feel sorry for you Japanese people who have to learn other languages also. It makes life far more difficult for you. Now, how do you turn messages into binary strings? Well, as we said, it was a matter of distinguishability. So if you look at a string of two binary digits, how many possible choices are there? There's 00, 01, 10, and 11. So there are four possible distinguishable messages that can be made from a string of two digits. How about if you have three binary digits? Well, then the first binary digit can be zero. The next two can be any one of those four things we just mentioned. The, the first binary digit can also be one, and the second two digits can be any one of those four things. So there are eight things all together. So three binary digits give rise to eight distinguishable combinations. Four binary digits, the first one can be zero, the next three can be any one of these eight things. Uh, the first digit can be one, and the next three digits can be any one of eight things. What is happening here? Every time we add an extra digit, we double the number of possible combinations we can talk about. So we have two to the n possible messages if we have n different binary digits. For those of you who don't like formulas, that means as we go from one, two, three, four, we go from two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, and it goes up very, very rapidly. With 10, uh, with 10 binary digits, you can represent over a thousand different things. With 20 binary digits, over a million different things. With 30, over a billion. With 40, over a trillion and so forth, it goes on and on to huge, humongous numbers, which are too big to imagine. People talk about Zeta uh, as, I, I believe it's 10 to the 21. I'm not sure, it might be 10 to the 24. It's an unimaginably large number. Uh, so anyway, there are two to the n binary strings that you can make out of n binary digits. People have recognized for a long time that it's better to use short strings for messages that are quite likely to come out of the source and longer strings for things which are less likely. What does that mean? Well, it's a game many of you are familiar with. It's a game of 20 questions. Was this invented by Shannon? No, it was invented 100 years before Shannon. Uh, in the game of 20 questions, there's a person who thinks of a word. And after that person thinks of a word, the questioner has 20 questions in order to try to guess what the word is. Now, think back. How many possible words can I represent by having 20 questions? Two to the 20. We can view a, this set of questions as a set of binary digits. So with 20 binary digits, uh, I can represent well over a million different words. But now, the trick for the questioner is to ask each question in a way to separate the remaining possibilities into two sets of almost equal likelihood. Should I start out with my first question saying, is it Shannon? No, that's a very bad first question to start with unless you have somebody like me who thinks all the time about Shannon, that then, it might, then it might make sense. Uh, but what you do is ask a question like, is it a living thing? And then you separate the possible things that the questioner, that the person who chose the word might be thinking about into two more or less equal, equal likelihood sets. People playing this game essentially determined this trick long before Shannon. But Shannon created an explicit mathematical theory for how to do this. And he, in this mathematical theory, he used it to identify 
uh, this number of questions that had to be asked, or, or the amount of uncertainty in, in a message as something called entropy. And this made all the mathematicians and all the physicists very happy because entropy was something they all studied and none of them understood it, or very few of them understood it. Entropy is a very difficult concept in statistical mechanics. So for many, many years, people were trying to teach other people about information theory, and they tried to do it by saying, well, just think, it's just like entropy in statistical mechanics. Well, the point is, entropy here is far, far simpler than entropy in statistical mechanics. Entropy is simply the question of how much uncertainty is there in this message? How many questions does it take to figure out what the, the right uh, message is that comes out of this source? That's what entropy is. And there's a beautiful mathematical theory connected with it. And if you're a physicist and you want to understand what entropy in statistical mechanics means, I suggest that you start out by studying entropy in information theory because it's a far simpler idea. Now, for our next example, how do you turn speech into binary strings? Well, speech is an analog waveform. So how do we do that? Well, you ask an engineer, how do you take an analog waveform and turn it into binary and they will all suggest the same thing. I don't know why they all suggest it, but one of the first things one learns in engineering is how do you sample waveforms? So their answer is always the same. You sample it. How many times do you have to sample it? Well, if you play around a little bit, uh, you realize that for speech, it only has relatively, relatively low frequencies in it, so the only way to represent the speech by sampling it is to use <coughs> up to 8,000 samples per second. And if you use 8,000 samples per second and then you smooth those samples, uh, presto, uh, you have the speech back again in a highly understandable form and in fact in a form that sounds perfectly natural. But then how do we turn all those samples into binary digits? Well, the samples are just numbers. So all we need to do is to quantize the numbers. So we quantize the numbers into 256 different possible values. We can do that with eight bits. So we use eight bits per sample and 8,000 samples per second. So you can, so any engineer uh, working for a very short time can sort out how to represent speech in 64,000 samples per second. Now, many engineers over many years have worked very hard on this question and have done marvelous things with it. And instead of using 64,000 bits per second, uh, now we use uh, 9,600 bits per second or 4,800 bits per second. And I understand one can do it in much less and still have perfectly understandable speech. So progress arises. Now let's come back and discuss the other parts of the generic communication system in the figure. I wanna discuss that later. And first I wanna describe how I became involved in this fascinating problem. I studied electrical engineering when I was a student, when I was so young that you wouldn't imagine it. Uh, I was at the University of Pennsylvania. I was a good student. I was, I say here, I was somewhat a nerd. I was really a nerd, if you had known me at the time. Uh, and I had no idea of what I wanted to do. Why was I in school? I was in school because my parents told me I ought to go to school. I studied engineering because my father was an engineer and I thought maybe that would make good sense. I wasn't sure I could get a good job as a mathematician, and I knew, knew I could get a good job as an engineer. After I graduated in 1953, I was still a good student, I was still enjoying studying, and I joined the switching department at Bell Telephone Laboratories. 
I started working with binary data. Computers were really in their infancy then. There were some uh, small number of computers around, but not many. There was nothing like this thing here. There was nothing like your stove at home, which is a little computer. Uh, nothing of that sort existed at the time. But these telephone systems had massive switching connected with them because whenever I picked up my phone to talk to somebody else, the operator, it was not automatic in those days, it was an operator, would have to connect me to this other person. There were a million other people around, so you needed some kind of switching circuit to take my voice and my system and send it to this destination. So, sure enough, there were many, many people in Bell Labs at that point working on switching theory, and I had a lot of fun doing this. I was living in Manhattan, New York at the same time, and that was a lot of fun also. Uh, I was becoming a little less of a nerd. I was still a nerd, though, but, but one has to learn slowly. Uh, anyway, I thought that engineering was fun, and I enjoyed doing it. After 18 months on the job, I was drafted into the U.S. Army, and I joined a group studying battlefield surveillance, i.e. communication systems under crisis conditions. Now you can imagine what this is like. Imagine yourself on a battlefield where the other army is trying to kill you. Are you going to use a communication system the way you learned in school to use it? Are you going to do everything the way you were told to do it? You're terrified. So suddenly the problem of communication on a battlefield becomes a psychological problem of how do you get people to somehow communicate what's going on. If I'm being killed and I don't communicate what's going on, I have very little chance of not being killed. So the problem of battlefield surveillance is really a joint problem between technology and human psychology. The problem was fascinating, but we were a relatively small group of bright but junior engineers. We had very little experience. The group was led, as in armies all over the place, uh, armies are led by officers who have very little technical experience, very little engineering experience, very little interest in doing anything interesting other than ordering people around. So the group made no progress whatsoever. I learned that doing system work with no leadership or meaningful objectives was a frustrating waste of time. So when we went, I found I could get out of the army three months early by going to graduate school. This is the story of my life you're hearing now. I was accepted to the EE department at MIT, that's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, many, many words. Uh, we encode it into MIT. And the math department at Yale, math is an encoding of mathematics. Uh, I chose MIT not because I thought it was a better school, I had no idea, I really didn't know that much about either school. It started two weeks before Yale started. I was desperate to get out of the Army. That was my only interest. I wanted to go back to Bell Labs as soon as I could anyway. So I went to MIT because it started two weeks early. So much for career choices. Uh, my career choices were bizarre, but I suspect if many of you look at your career choices and your children's career choices, you will recognize that they are just as bizarre. Uh, we all do kind of crazy things. At MIT, I was a research assistant. I, was, I joined the information theory group there. It was led by Peter Elias and Robert Fano. That won't mean anything to you unless you've studied information theory. But if you have, you will know that both of them were brilliant researchers, did many, many interesting things. Robert Fano also was uh, very prominent in starting computer research uh, going at MIT. So uh, anyway, information theory was just starting to be understood 
in the academic world at that time. That's another interesting story. This was 1956. This was eight years after Claude Shannon had done his work. It took eight years before people were really starting to understand what this theory was about. Now, that age, as opposed to now, was very, very different because we didn't have any technology. Today, uh, you will hear other people giving talks in other fields where this marvelous technology exists and all they have to do is get the idea and then they build something. Back then, uh, it wasn't enough to just get the idea. Shannon got the idea, but it took everybody else a very long time to sort out how to possibly use any of this. Uh, but anyway, at this time, MIT with uh, Peter Elias and Bob Fano there, and many, many students coming in from all over the world, it was starting to become a leading center for information theory, almost rivaling Bell Labs. Claude Shannon was visiting this group in 1956 when I got there. Brilliant students were there from all over the world. I felt really intimidated because they were much smarter than I was. They certainly understood much more about information theory than I did. They came there because they were hoping that, uh, that they would have this marvelous new technology that they heard a great deal about and I didn't, hadn't heard much about it, so I thought uh, this would be fine, but I felt very inferior to these people. I soon found that our group of students was not only brilliant, but most of them were determined to truly understand the subject. They were determined to work with each other and to help each other. If, you, if you're just starting out working and you find a group of people where most of them are primarily interested in helping others, treasure it because there aren't a whole lot of groups that way uh, and it's far more valuable than working in a group where everyone is uh, trying to make a profit for themselves. But anyway, with this wonderful group, uh, we all were working together. I quickly started to learn about information theory but also after the Army experience, I really learned how wonderful it was to work in this kind of environment. I say productive environment here. Uh, it's not so much productive as the idea it was a friendly environment. It was a supportive environment. It was people at their very, very best. We all grew together. And today it's surprising how much of the best work in information theory was done by this group both then and later. My master's thesis was nothing exceptional. In fact, it was pretty poor, but I was learning and wanted to stay in this remarkable group. And Shannon joined the faculty permanently in 1958. Most of us were working on error correction back at that point, and I started my doctoral research in that problem. So I wanna tell you a little bit about what that problem was about. It's not, it's not quite obvious immediately. For systems that first convert messages into binary strings, and we talked a little bit about that, error correction means correcting binary errors because that's what you have to correct. These are caused by channel noise, but are corrected in the encoder and decoder below, which you can see as the intermediate point in, uh, if I point, no. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it is the middle block, uh, and in block diagrams, uh, they are helpful because you can concentrate on one block at a time, and after you understand that one block, you can go on and understand other blocks. Let's start out with the simplest possible example of how you might correct errors. Think of a single parity check. The parity of a bit string is one if the string contains an odd number of ones and it's zero otherwise. The simplest imaginable code for correcting channel errors is to put the parity of a short string at the end of the string. In other words, you lengthen, lengthen the string by one bit. And when you do this, if the string contained an odd number of ones, you add a one and then 
that the total number of ones is even, so the parity is zero. If the original number of ones is even, then you add a zero, and the overall parity is zero. So whatever you encode, whatever you encode coming out of the source has even parity. But how do you decide which bit is in error? Well, that puzzled people for a long time. And some engineers said, well, we just need to have many, many more checks of this sort. But other people said, well, let's think a little bit about what the modulator and demodulator are doing. If I have a demodulator, which is trying to take this signal and turn it into a binary digit, it's making a decision on something, whether it should be one or should be zero. And if you're making a decision on something noisy about whether it's one or zero, sometimes you're pretty sure, and sometimes you're not quite sure. So what you should do is you should append to this decision the likelihood the, of, of, of whether you think you're right or not. That's called soft decoding, where you add to what you decode uh, your likelihood that a particular bit is right or wrong. Then you correct an error if an error occurs, if the, if the parity of what comes out of this, uh, out of this demodulator is uh, odd, uh, then what you do is take the least likely bit and you change it. Then the parity is even again, and since most often what gets changed is the thing that was most likely to have been changed, you actually correct the error. So this trivial coding and decoding technique reduces the error probability somewhat by sending one redundant bit per k source bits. The rate of this code is the number of bits that you comes out of the uh, source uh, divided by the number of bits out of the source plus the redundant bits that you add. So that's called rate. It's it's the redundancy. It's it's the uh, yes. Finding better schemes to correct errors than this crazy, silly one I just mentioned uh, has been a major endeavor for the last 60 years. Shannon characterized the information over a noisy channel as the entropy of the channel input less the conditional entropy of input given output. Now, what does that mean? Entropy means information, we said. It also means uncertainty. How can it both mean information and uncertainty? Well, there's uncertainty before, and there's information after. You see what comes out, and then the uncertainty is resolved. So entropy both means information in that sense, and it means uncertainty. Now, Shannon can characterize this information as the original uncertainty less the uncertainty that still remained after you saw the other digits. Uh, now, the real part of Shannon's genius came at this point. He decided that what you really ought to do was to first look at these channels and sort out statistically what was going on with them. Uh, you want to look at all the different ways that you could put data into them all the different ways that data would, all the different ways that data would then come out, given the noise, and you ought to define the information over the channel as what goes in, uh, less what you don't have after you see what comes out. And then he made the remarkable observation that if you found this number called channel capacity, it was possible to find a code where the code, if you made the rate of the code less than this capacity, namely that told you how much redundancy you had to add. So you add that much redundancy and just a little bit more. And if you make the constraint length of this code long enough, uh, then you can actually get very small error probability over that whole block. So this was why people were trying for many, many years 
uh, to invent better codes because they knew that there was this number called capacity for many channels. Not all channels have a capacity, but many do. And if you made chose a rate smaller than that capacity, uh, you could transmit at that rate without errors. Why do you want to send at a large rate? Well, you want a large rate so you can send a lot of data. So that was the, that was the name of the game at that point. I'm going to skip this, these next two paragraphs that I have here. Those of you who understand something about information theory, it will all make sense. If you don't understand it, I don't think it will make sense. I used to spend a week in my graduate information theory course talking about this. And if I spent a week talking about it and you were interested, you would understand it. Without being interested, you won't understand it. And without taking a week, you won't understand it. And if you want to understand it, pick up a book on information theory. It's the right way to do it. But anyway, what happened with these coding systems uh, was people could find codes very easily that were very good. The problem was that they were very expensive to do the decoding. It was very, very hard because you had this enormous variety of possible received sequences. The number of received sequences grows exponentially uh, with the number of bits that you're en encoding. So the problem gets very, very hard very, very quickly. So the major problem for 60 years is how do you find good codes that you can decode easily? And if you want a better statement of that, read a book on information theory. They will all talk about it. As the use of communication systems proliferated, networks also grew in size and messages traversed multiple communication links traveling to the destination. Analog messages that were not converted to binary would be subject to noise accumulation on the links. Uh, so it was necessary to build networks to have error correction. As the networks got bigger, the error correction got more important. Uh, each link could transmit any kind of message, so the standardization of link technology became very important. So there in these two obvious observations, you sort of see what was going on as the internet started to grow. I invented low density parity check codes, which are abbreviated LDPC. They're encoded LDPC in my doctoral research in 1958 to 1960. LDPC successfully reduced required decoding complexity, uh, but it wasn't, didn't reduce it enough to be very practical at that time. So I received a doctorate. I got a faculty appointment because people were impressed with the idea, but they said it wasn't practical. Uh, so the whole thing was forgotten for 20 years. By 1980 to 95, computation became super fast and cheap. So LDPC became practical and many researchers improved or reinvented it. They achieved negligible error probability with rates approaching capacity. So this was just what people started out to do a long, long time ago. And the solution was uh, one of a bunch of ideas. There were, there were really many good ideas for doing error correction, but for all of them, it was a matter of the technology coming along later, which made it inexpensive enough to do. LDPC now, is a standard for wireless systems, 4G and 5G. For those of you who are familiar with wireless, those are the two major standards that are being used today, and LDPC is being used on them. Now, communication in the information age uh, differs vastly from the era around 1960. It's not only that we couldn't decode these codes back then, uh, but the whole communication aura is different. Cell phones now enable contact everywhere, but they're also entrees to all the wonders and massive data 
stored on the internet. Our desk computers are directly connected to the internet and they constantly exchange data with it. Whether we want to or not, they are talking back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And sometimes they do it in a good way. Most of the time they do it in a good way. Um, so uh, the internet has accelerated all of these interactions because most of the things we use today, as I was saying, our home uh, coffee maker uh, is all automated. It's a little computer. Our stove is a little computer. Our oven is a little computer. Our vacuum cleaner is a little computer. Everything is a computer. Uh, we are computers ourselves even, although we try to avoid doing that some of the time. The internet has accelerated all of our interactions, social, economic, political, artistic, musical, athletic, it's accelerated them. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's all better. In the past, scientists and engineers searched through books and files of paper stored in their offices. Now most of this searching takes place via the internet. We still have books and files of paper in our offices. We're too lazy to clean them out. But most stuff sits there on our, on our computer. The internet resembles a gigantic encyclopedia in this sense. Instead of searching alphabetically, we simply search via Google. At their best, these internet searches resemble being at a first-rate institution, research institution, and having colleagues, brilliant colleagues, sitting all around us, just waiting for us to ask them questions. We ask them questions, they give us their best answers. Wouldn't that be lovely if we were in that situation? That's what the internet is at its best. At its worst, the searches resemble automated phone answering at corporations. I don't know why corporations do this. I think perhaps they don't want to talk to anybody, but they ask callers many questions. Uh, they don't understand the answers, uh, and they don't seem interested in connecting people uh, to who they want to talk to. The information that gets communicated and stored on the internet is really information in the Shannon sense. It's distinguishable choices from the sources. It's not always correct. It's not always informative. It doesn't always lead to knowledge. It's not always consistent. Having so much of this information stored and accessible even though it's not all correct, is enormously valuable. It's like, it's like all of our storage of information was before computers. There was lots of stuff that wasn't valid. There's lots of stuff that wasn't true. But if you threw away all the stuff that wasn't any good, you'd throw away the stuff that was good also. So you really had to keep it all and then learn how to use it. As with the library, new information keeps getting added. It sometimes contributes understanding to the old information, uh, sometimes not. Google is a major improvement over indexes. And when I say Google, I don't mean to advertise the company Google. I mean any search engine. I'll just call them all Google because that's what we usually call them. It has limited understanding of the data, uh, its decisions, employ the short-term re reactions from other viewers that it gets. So it sort of decides what to show us in terms of what other viewers want. And that might be good, and it might not be too good. There's no doubt that the internet has greatly speeded up the rate of technological progress. But the change has been so rapid and so massive. I mean, think of it, in 50 years, our civilization has changed so much. Can you think of another period of time when civilization has changed that much? It's, it's amazing. We operate in very different ways. As one example, you often see a couple in a restaurant, their fingers furiously dancing over their, uh, over their cell phones. They ignore each other. They are not talking. They are not communicating. 
They're simply looking at stuff. This rapid access to information is very addictive. We all tend to click before we think. We query to, observe, to absorb more detail before we analyze and we question what the big picture is. There's all this stuff waiting there to be looked at. Scientists and engineers increasingly write papers adding small details to other detail accessed on the web. And it might not even be right, but it gets through reviewers because reviewers are so busy writing their own papers that they don't carefully review the papers they're supposed to review. So publishing 100 plus papers a year is not unusual anymore for an author. But publishing one notable paper in a lifetime is very unusual. Einstein's four famous papers in 1905 revolutionized physics for a generation. Four papers, not a hundred. Four. Uh, Shannon's lifetime output of 42 papers revolutionized communication and computer science. It's not how many papers you publish, it's whether you publish one good paper in your lifetime or not. That's the important thing. Perhaps the old academic adage of publish or perish should be changed to think first, publish later, or think first, then question, then think, then publish. It's important to recognize that the massiveness of information on the web is not the problem. I just pointed out that we've always had lots of information available. Information in Shannon's sense of being choices between different things that might be there. The real problem is how to access that information. Wikipedia helps a great deal by providing easily accessed information that's been edited to promote knowledge as well as information. Even Wikipedia is not always correct, but it's closer. Google's practice of providing many choices in response to a query is a bit of a mixed blessing. Why? Well, if you have many choices, that gives you a lot of flexibility, but it also encourages quick, casual surveys of each, followed by cherry-picking of the information. What is going on there? When, when you're searching furiously over a very large amount of information, what do you do? You look for something that looks familiar. Namely, you look for something that suits your biases. When you find something that suits your biases, you pick it up and you favor it over other things. So all of this rapid searching increases our use of biases uh, all the time. It makes us more polarized than we would be otherwise. Facebook and Twitter create information that's designed for a highly polarized audience. It further enhances this polarization. For all these polarizing effects on the web, they probably have something to do with the increase in polarization we see in politics throughout the world. I don't know how much of an effect that is, uh, but I know it's an important effect. These problems with internet access don't appear to be fundamental problems of internet communication. They're problems of accessing the web. They will require the best efforts of both researchers and engineers and we as users. We must learn to better use the internet, both those who answer the queries and those who go furiously searching through all this data. We must learn how to do this. We haven't learned to do it yet very well. We need to, uh, as we search, to look for deep understanding and to look for conceptual integration between multiple areas. Humans have risen to such challenges before, and I hope with determination we can do so again. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.